It's a great pleasure to mark the centenary of the 1920 San Remo Conference with UK Lawyers for Israel and to be invited to present some thoughts on the importance of what transpired in that beautiful coastal city in northwestern Italy a hundred years ago. The San Remo Conference exhibited an unprecedented international consensus around the creation of a home for the Jewish people. It set the stage and provided the historical context for the later establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. And it's the San Remo Conference that provides the most striking rebuttal to the increasingly popular but utterly unfounded and irrational charge that Israel is a colonialist entity. And that's for two reasons. First, because the very impetus of the San Remo Conference drove towards self-determination and the decolonization of the Middle East. And second, because at San Remo, the indigenous nature of the Jewish people in the land of Israel was acknowledged. After the First World War in November 1918, the Turkish Empire had lost and its territory fell to be partitioned by the victorious powers. This marked an end to Ottoman hegemony over vast swathes of territory including that of modern-day Israel. The Allied powers began a process of reinventing the region, determining the allocation of the Middle Eastern territories. Now, this was a process that began at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. It continued at San Remo, where Britain, France, Japan and Italy, with the United States observing, met between the 18th and the 26th of April 1920. The allocation of territories was later affirmed in the Treaty of Sevres. The future of the territories captured from the Ottoman Empire was to be determined via a system of mandates under which the lands would be held and administered under a sacred trust of civilization to develop the territory for the benefit of its native people. The Allies asserted that not all parts of the Middle East were ready for full independence. Mandates were therefore established for the governance of three territories, Syria, Mesopotamia, and Palestine. In each case, one of the Allied powers was assigned to implement the mandate until the territory in question could stand alone. Britain, represented at San Remo by Prime Minister David Lloyd George and the Foreign Secretary Lord Curzon was decided to be the mandatory power for Palestine. Crucially at San Remo, in the context of establishing the mandate in Palestine, the Allies decided on the 25th of April 1920 to adopt the Balfour Declaration, determining that the mandatory, Britain, would be responsible for putting into effect the declaration in favour of establishing in Palestine a national home for the Jewish people, creating an operative obligation. The conference confirmed international recognition of the right of Jewish self-determination in a place known to the Jews as the land of Israel. It was clear at the time that the term national home really meant a state and the purpose of the mandate was to facilitate that. Now, the principle of self-determination has developed in modern international law to be widely accepted as a preemptory norm, jus cogens, a fundamental principle of international law that is accepted by the international community of states as binding. But it was in the aftermath of the First World War, and in the context of this succession of conferences, that the principle really came to prominence. Importantly, it was included in President Woodrow Wilson's famous 14 points, unveiled on the 8th of January 1918. And on the 11th of February 1918, President Wilson stated, national aspirations must be respected. People may now be dominated and governed only by their own consent. Self-determination is not a mere phrase. It is an imperative principle of action. Part and parcel of this was the international recognition and acknowledgement of the right to Jewish self-determination. 
While some have argued that the mandate system was a continuation of British and French colonialism, it's clear that the mandates were temporary by design and eventually gave way to Arab and Jewish independence. The mandate system was essentially presented as a move towards decolonization in keeping with US President Woodrow Wilson's clear direction, a step on the way to returning much of the Middle East to its indigenous peoples, freeing them from the Ottoman colonizers who had ruled for 400 years. This saw the creation of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon and Jordan. As a result, some have argued that Jewish self-determination was in fact an integral part of a process that ended up decolonizing the Middle East in an effort that led to Arab as well as Jewish independence. So that was the drive toward self-determination and the decolonization of the Middle East. But what of recognizing the inalienable right of Jewish self-determination in the land of Israel by virtue of the people's connection to the land. In Israel's case, this was recognition of a movement and a process which had begun in the previous century. Jews had been re-establishing their presence independently in the land well before the British and French dismantled the Ottoman Empire. By 1862, the Jewish people had already recovered their majority in Jerusalem. That is why decades later, the League of Nations considered Jewish rights in Palestine to be beyond their power to bestow. They were there already. The League of Nations therefore acknowledged a pre-existing right and gave recognition to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine. San Remo was the political climate that surrounded the reconstitution of the Jewish home. This was further reflected in the 1922 White Paper, in which the British Secretary of State, Winston Churchill, declared that the Jewish people were in Palestine as of right and not on sufferance. The same right recognized at San Remo by reason of the Jewish people's historical connection and progress in reconstituting a Jewish home. Many have described the language adopted at San Remo as a triumph for Zionism, recognizing the existence of Jews as more than individuals who subscribe to a certain religion, but rather as a corporate group deserving of national expression, in this case, in the form of a national home in the ancient homeland of the Jews. The language agreed upon at San Remo was, as British Foreign Secretary Lord Curzon put it, the Magna Carta of the Zionists. San Remo clearly demonstrates that the repeated recent associations of Israel with colonialism are ahistorical and utterly false. San Remo is an important point in the recognition of a millennia long association of Jews with the land of Israel as an indigenous people, which the myth of colonialism seeks to erase. But it also ignores something the British Peel Commission report of 1937 was quite clear about, that it was the return of Jews to the land of Israel that gave context to and critical mass for parallel Arab self-determination. Now, certain lessons can be drawn from the historical processes at work at San Remo. The refusal to recognize the right of Jewish people to a state of their own in their historic homeland has been said to be the real root of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. It has been highlighted as a key prerequisite for ending the conflict. And indeed, the denial of this right has been part of the international campaign to challenge Israel's very legitimacy. For that reason, it is critical to re-emphasize the international, legal, and historical foundations of this idea in order to challenge the current discourse of delegitimization and restore the place of Jewish self-determination as an internationally accepted norm. The recognition of the rights of Jewish people to a nation state of their own with roots in international legitimacy and international proposals going back to San Remo and the British mandate 
may not be required for the legal foundations of the establishment of Israel in 1948, there are other factors that apply to independence. But it is undoubtedly necessary for the furtherance of any progress to meaningful and lasting peace.